Yesterday, a Boeing 787-9 Dreamliner from Air Canada ended up on the side of taxiway Mike in Vancouver. This happened while the aircraft was being positioned from its gate to remote parking, uh, awaiting a later departure about 10 hours later. There has been footage of, from this incident that was shown all over Twitter, as it usually does. It's also available on YouTube. And the link to the original owner of this piece, which is called Kent Matthiasen, is here in the description of the video. And I highly recommend you to go and check out his Twitter account because not only does he have a video of, um, well, the aftermath of this incident, but also he has some really good high definition um, pictures of it, which is really good. But before we go any further, let's have a look at the video in question. The video starts here, you can see that there's some firefighters uh, looking at the nose wheel, which is properly down into the dirt there. You see the engines doesn't seem to have touched, which is a good thing, and then we have the main gear here. And then you have those cables, which are probably some proper kind of um, link chains connected to a tug, and that tug is now getting ready to, to remove the aircraft. So first of all, as you would expect, I've gotten some questions regarding this incident and some of the most common questions is how come that there was engineers or mechanics in the flight deck and not pilots? Well, it turns out that this is actually fairly common. Uh, first of all, the aircrafts are very often moved during night nighttime, for example, uh, from the gates where the passengers have disembarked onto remote stands so that incoming jets can have access to the uh, the jetways, right? So this, it's not uncommon that there's kind of a reshuffling of, of uh, aircraft and you don't need flight crew for that. In most cases, um, at least where I come from, where I operate, this is done by engineers in the flight deck, but they're then being towed. So there needs to be someone in the flight deck at all times for the simple reason that you need to have someone that operates the anti-collision light, you need to have communication between the tow and the flight deck in case something would go wrong. And there also needs to be someone who can operate the brakes on board. So there's always going to be someone in the flight deck when an aircraft is being moved. Okay, that's number one. What's a little bit less common is for the engineer to actually start up the aircraft and actually move the aircraft with its, you know, by its own power. However, it is allowed that most uh, CAAs out there, as in civil aviation authorities, will allow you to do this, but under a couple of stringent circumstances. A, you need to obviously be a licensed engineer to do this. You could be a licensed mechanic in some cases as well. Uh, you need to have training on the particular aircraft type. You need to have enough experience to do this. You need to have training to do this particular thing. And you need to have the um, kind of the license to do so from both the civil aviation authorities and from the owner of the aircraft. So there's a couple of, of rules involved. In some cases, if you're going to be taxiing around on active taxiways, or even onto runways, and in that case, you also need to have a valid um, radio license so that you can operate the radios on board. But anyway, if, if you kind of fulfill all of these requirements and this is in your job description, then this is perfectly normal. So, so what's happened in this case then? Well, what we can see from the footage is that it looks like the nose wheel has gotten out to the left and the main gear on the left-hand side has also gotten out way into the mud. And as you can see, <laughs> when you do that, when you go out over the grass, you have to understand that these aircraft, they weigh loads and loads. Even empty, they're extremely heavy. So the pressure on both the nose gear and on the main gear is really high. So it basically just flows straight down into the mud, okay? Um, the fact is that these aircraft, we are not even allowed to taxi on some paved surfaces because if the pavement classification number, which is kind of the number that, that you know, measures how how much pressure a surface can take. If that's not high enough, an aircraft like this can actually close straight through the asphalt as well. So it will do this even if the ground is, is partially frozen, okay? So th the fact that it looks like this, I'm not surprised at all. What actually led to it can be a number of different things. And we don't know, we haven't heard yet exactly what happened here. But what has happened on a number of occasions before is that if you're out taxiing, especially during nighttime, which it was in this case, if you're not used to taxiing very often, 
um, you can become disoriented by all the light, right? We're taxiing following green centerline lights normally. And then you tend to have blue lights on the edges of the taxiways, uh, but there are also green lights um, that has to do with runways and there are red lights for stop bars that you're not allowed to stop. So there's a load of different lights and different uh, kind of indications out there. And if you are a little bit unused to it, um, there is a possibility to just have a brain fart basically and interpret the light as something else, maybe interpret a, an edge light, like a center line light, and then just make one false turn and you very quickly end up in a situation like this. This is human and it has happened on a number of occasions. Now, something that is similar to this that is more serious is what we call runway excursions. So I've done a video about runway excursions. You can, you can check that out. Um, that is actually one of the very few safety related instances that are on the rise in the airline industry. While things like control flight into terrain and technical malfunctions and loss of control in flight are all kind of coming down and it's getting more and more under control. One of the very few things that is on the rise and I'm betting yet that you've heard about at least a few incidents of that just the last few months is runway excursions. Now, runway excursions is a slightly different animal, but from time to time you also see people taxiing off the, the, the runway while they're doing 180 turns or when they're turning to enter a taxiway. So mistakes will always happen, okay? Another thing that could lead you to exit a runway or a taxiway is asymmetric trust, okay? Now, what you have to understand is that the engines on a beast like the 787 are extremely powerful. The aircraft is now completely empty as well. So if you have more thrust on one engine, especially if that thrust comes on suddenly, then there will be an enormous momentum from that engine trying to push the aircraft off the side of the taxiway. This is why we always do an engine run-up before we do a takeoff. You know, have you noticed that as you enter the runway, the, air, the aircraft always kind of spools the engines up a little bit first before the takeoff thrust is set? And that is for us, the pilots, to make sure that both engines are accelerating up at the same pace so that when we set higher thrust setting, we get the same acceleration on both engines. Now, this is really important because if we don't do that, Let's say that we would, for example, set takeoff thrust immediately and one engine just accelerates a little bit slower than the other. Well, then what you might have is full thrust on one side, the other one hasn't gotten up there yet and the aircraft will just veer off the runway. All right, it will go really, really quick. And if you are on a taxiway, which is generally much more narrow, you have even less time to react to something like that. Okay, so if for whatever reason, um, they accidentally hit one of the thrust levels, for example, or they try to do some, some test of the engine while they were taxiing, then something like this can happen very quickly. We have something called VMCG, right? This is a little bit outside of the topic, but it's the minimum speed for control on the ground. Um, and that's the speed that you need to have with the aircraft for the rudder to be aerodynamically effective enough to counteract an engine failure. Okay, because when we set takeoff thrust as we're rolling down the runway, if you haven't reached that speed and you have an engine failure and you're not very quick with reducing thrust on the live engine as in doing a rejected takeoff, you might end up in a situation like this as well. Once again, because as you're putting opposite rudder to try to keep yourself on the runway, the rudder just does not have enough air flowing over it in order to counteract the yaw. Now, obviously that's not the case here. They would have been taxiing at a very low speed Generally, you're never taxiing more than 30 knots in a straight line. We tend to have a restriction of about 10 knots around corners, 15 knots if you're anywhere close to, to other aircraft. Um, so that wouldn't be the case here. But asymmetric thrust, if they for whatever reason got that, then you know it would have very quickly kind of push the aircraft towards the side. And you could end up in something like this before you have time to kind of toss uh, cut the trust and get onto the brakes. So, so what will happen here then? Well, I mean, from an operational point of view, it's fairly simple. Okay, you can see already here that the aircraft authorities are getting ready to pull 
the aircraft back onto the taxiway again. You will always have firefighters available because this is not a normal event. So in case something would happen, if something would snap, um, then you want to have the firefighters ready. Okay, but it's fairly straightforward. They will attach these chain links onto the uh, the main gear. Main gear is extremely strong, and then they will very very carefully try to pull the aircraft back up. And once it's back up on the taxiway again, it's probably going to be you know pulled onto an engineering site. Um, they're going to have to check the nose gear. They're going to have to check the main gears. You know, clean it out. Check the brakes. Check all of the hydraulic equipment as well to make sure nothing has been damaged. But in most cases that part of the aircraft is extremely sturdy. So I wouldn't expect it to be any damage from this. It's gonna be a delay, obviously, that costs money. Now, for the poor chaps up in, in the front, uh, what generally tends to happen whenever you have an incident like this is that they are required to write an incident report, okay? So they will write down exactly what they perceived has happened, and then there will be an investigation into it. But what you have to understand, and I get this question a lot, is that, in the airline industry, we operate from a just culture perspective. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that everyone in an organization understands that mistakes can be made, okay? But what's important is that everyone involved reports what has gone wrong, that they're honest, and that there was no kind of malignant thought behind it, that it wasn't a, a gross misconduct that led up to this, okay? so. That's what's going to be checked now. For example, if this was an honest mistake, or if they'd made a mistake, they thought they could do something which they couldn't and it led to this, then generally what happens is that, you know, they will, the investigation will conclude that that was not a good idea. There will be some training given out to the people that was involved, and then there's going to be information going out to anyone else who could be in a similar situation to make sure that that doesn't happen again. However, if, for example, and I'm not saying this now, if someone were to be playing around doing something kind of funny, showing their mates what, what they can do, and that leads to it, then that can lead to suspension and it can lead to disciplinary actions, of course. So a just culture will always take into account that mistakes can be made. It can happen to me, it can happen to you, it can happen to anyone. All right. The important thing here is that you're honest and that you report it and it gets investigated. That's the only way for us to get better, for things like this not to happen, basically. That's all I had about this, guys. I love to hear your questions and see your discussions about this. So go into the discussions here in the comments below. Tell me what you would like to see more of. And also let me know if you see something on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram, something that you think that, oh, I'd love to get his opinion on this. Well, in that case, send me a message, right? I, I have my, my Discord. You can go in there and you can just tag me immediately. You can go into my app, Mentor Aviation which is also free, and there's a link in the uh, description to get it. Uh, or anyway, tag me on Twitter, for example, because, you know, that's, that's how I build this kind of content. Oh, by the way, guys, before you go, I'm sure you've noticed that it's nice and white here behind me. Now that's going to change because what I've done is I have reached out to some aviation artists. Artists that I found, for example, on Instagram that I think do an amazing job with their aviation art. And I'm going to highlight them, right? For a couple of months, there's going to be some artwork from aviation artists behind here, and I'm going to put their Instagram tag or where it might be next to the art. So I'm hope I hope you're going to like that, and of course, there's going to be links to it here in the description as well. So if you are an aviation artist out there and you do some really nice art that you think should be shown to the world, well then contact me directly, and we'll see if we can get your art up on the wall behind me. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.